Come on, I'm not that late, Peyton said, flopping down on the couch. Her mum was such a worrywart. It was what came of watching all those crime shows on TV. You're late enough. I told you to be home before dark, and you're home after dark, her mum said. Do I need to explain to you what before and after mean? Peyton stifled the urge to roll her eyes. Her mother hated nothing more than an eye roll. No, you don't need to explain what before and after mean. I'm glad to hear it. Her mum's voice was tight with tension. You know, I never worried about you, like this, when you were hanging out with Abigail. Peyton was in no mood for one of her mums. Abigail good, Marley bad lectures. That was because Abigail lives just two doors down. No, it was because Abigail is responsible, and when you were with Abigail, I knew you'd be responsible too. With Marley, I am not so sure. When Abigail and I were best friends, we were little kids. It wasn't that we were so responsible, it was that an adult was watching us all the time. Marley and I aren't little kids. You haven't got used to the fact that I'm not a baby anymore. Her mum sighed. Peyton, I still think of you as my baby even when you're 30 years old. I recognise that you're growing up, but part of growing up is showing responsibility. If you tell me you'll be home by a certain time, it's your responsibility to make that happen. If you want to be treated like an adult, you have to act like one. The eye roll happened before Peyton could stop it. But seriously, where had a mum gotten that statement? The parents' big book of cliches? Eye rolling. That's very adult, her mum said. Go take a shower and get ready for bed. Peyton dragged herself up the stairs as slowly as she possibly could. She didn't want to push her luck anymore by being openly disobedient. But she also wanted to sh her mum to know that she wasn't happy about following orders. This week, the unit they were studying in home economics was called Eggs, the Basic. <laughs> How to Basic. Um, on Monday, Mrs. Crutchfield had lectured them on the uh, nuances of shopping for eggs, which included the importance of checking for expiration dates and breakage. They had made both hard-boiled and soft-boiled eggs, which Peyton thought was going to be the easiest cooking assignment ever. She was shocked when Mrs. Crutchfield gave her a B because she didn't wash the egg before boiling it. Seriously? It wasn't like you ate the shell, and besides, didn't boiling water clean things anyway? At least Peyton did better than her mum did when she was in Mrs. Crutchfield's class. Her mum had been getting a C-minus egg boiler. Tuesday was scrambled eggs, a B-plus because they were slightly overdone, and Wednesday was poached, a D-plus, and a mess to boot. Peyton was beginning to doubt that the course was going to be easy A, Marley had said it was. Today, though, they were having a break from eggs. Mitch's Crossfield laughed entirely too much when she said this. To go on their field trip to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit Factory, where the pizza kits were made. Peyton wasn't that excited about touring the factory, but she was definitely relieved to get away from all those eggs. On the tour, the kids would get to make their own pizza kits, which would be delivered to home economics class the next day. After days of eggs prepared in every way imaginable, a pizza sounded pretty good. Peyton took a seat next to Marley on the bus. The culinary acts, uh, the cu oh my god, I keep saying culinary acts. The culinary arts class boarded after them, including Sean Anderson, who caught sight of Marley and promptly stumbled into the person in front of him. Marley and Peyton laughed. He's trying to get up the nerve to ask me to do the full dance, Marley whispered after, she, after he was out of earshot. It'd be easier if he didn't fall every time he saw you, Peyton said, and they both giggled. Peyton was glad she could make Marley laugh. She knew she couldn't be the pretty friend, but at least she could be the funny friend. This tour is going to be lame, Marley said. So lame, Peyton said, even though she was actually glad for the break in routine. Freddy Fazbear's for babies, and the sauce on Freddy's pizza tastes like ketchup. The crust is styrofoam, and I don't even know what the cheese is made out of. Marley yawned, Peyton supposed, to demonstrate that she was already bored with the experience even though it hadn't happened yet. Dandruff, Peyton said. The cheese is actually the dandruff of the Freddy Fazbear pizza workers. Uh, they just shake their heads over every pizza. Ew, gross, Marley said, but she was laughing. When they got off the bus, Mrs. Crutchfield read their names from a clipboard and made them line up alphabetically. Now in a moment, the factory manager, Miss Bryant, is going to join us and tell you all about the factory safety regulations. Please play... Oh my god, there's so many typos in this. Please pay close attention. 
Factories are dangerous places if you don't follow the rules. Molly rolled her eyes. How dangerous could a pizza factory be? Peyton didn't have time to think up a wisecrack because a pretty short black woman, presumably Miss Bryant, came out to join Mrs. Crutchfield. Though the factory manager wore the same kind of net cap cafeteria workers wore on their heads, her body was encased in a yellow bird costume that looked like a Freddy Fazbear friend that Peyton remembered from her childhood. Interesting. <laughs> the bird had always been Peyton's favourite and for a moment she racked her brain to remember its name. Chica. That was it. Is that going to be the threat in this, in this story? Is Chica going to be the one chasing them down? She's suddenly going to come alive. Peyton smiled to see the Chica's costume familiar bib. Um, nearly printed with the words let's eat with the word pizza scribbled in marker below. <laughs> Good morning, young ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit Factory. The factory manager said, smiling. We like to think we make the best custom pizzas in the country and we're delighted to have you as our guests today. Now, first things first, everyone's going to have to, ha uh, have to wear a fashionable cap like the one I have on here. She posed like a model and then laughed. Molly let out a, lo a loud groan and Mrs. Crutchfield shot her a look. I know they're not very glamorous, but it's a hygiene issue, Mrs. Bryant continued. Is it Miss Bryant or Mrs. Bryant? <laughs> oh, there's so many spelling mistakes. I'm so sorry. Oh, this is ridiculous. Um, nobody wants human hair as a pizza topping. Now there were more groans, this time from disgust. Miss Bryant handed Mrs. Crutchfield a box. Mrs. Crutchfield, if you, would ha if you would pass out the caps, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, make sure all your hair gets tucked inside. Those of you with long hair need to be especially careful. This is already worse than I thought it would be, Marnie said, holding her cap between her index finger and thumb, as if it were a dead rat. Peyton put on her cap and tucked her hair inside. I look like one of those old ladies who works in the school cafeteria, she said. She scrunched her face up into an old ladyish expression and said, You want some corn with that? <laughs> Marnie shook her head. You are such a dork. She slapped the cap onto her head. My hair is going to be an ugly, sweaty mess by the time I get to take this thing off. Now, let me continue to have your attention, please, Miss Bryant said. There are a number of safety issues for touring the facility. Walk in a straight line and stay with your group at all times. There is to be no touching of any of the factory equipment under any circumstances. However, she smiled, each of you will be given a card and a pencil to carry with you as you tour the facility. Put your name on the card and check off the toppings you would like to have in your very own Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit. Each of your pizzas will be assembled and then delivered to you at your school tomorrow. She smiled widely. How cool is that? No one offered an opinion on how cool it was. Oh, and one other thing, Miss Bryant said. She sounded a little disappointed that people weren't acting more excited. As you enter the facility, make sure you grab some earplugs from James, who will be standing there by the door. It can get awfully loud in there. She looked around, trying to one more hopeful smile. Well, be safe and enjoy the tour. Shall we get started? Peyton was surprised at how loud the inside of the factory was, even with her earplugs in. She couldn't imagine what it must be like to work in that level of noise all day. Miss Bryant had to yell into a megaphone to make herself heard over the whirring and chugging of the machinery. The first area is where the dough is mixed. Workers in caps, plaques, eh. Plastic gloves and white smocks dumped flour and yeast and water into giant canisters filled with enormous metal blades that mix the ingredients into a gooey, stretchy dough. And the next room is where it gets kind of hot. <laughs> My bedroom. No, I'm joking. Um, Miss Bryant said, leading them into a sauna-like room where huge vats of tomato sauce bubbled and steamed while being stirred by gigantic paddles. Even standing in the room for a minute made Peyton break out in a sweat, and she wondered how the workers could stand the heat all day. The bubbling vats reminded her of witches' cauldrons. This is gross, Molly whispered. It's so hot, I already feel like I need a shower. And now, if you'll follow me, you'll see where it, co where it all comes together, Miss Bryant said, motioning them forward. The assembly line, and here's where it gets really loud. The whirring, chugging and pounding in the assembly room was almost too loud to bear. Mrs. Bryant 
pointed out where the dough was dropped into balls, then flattened into discs. The discs moved around uh, and forward on a conveyor belt and were then squirted with sauce. Next, the saucy dough was sprinkled with cheese. Next is what we call our topping bar, Miss Bryant said, gesturing toward huge clear cylinders labelled pepperoni, sausage, peppers, ground beef, meatballs, anchovies, mushrooms, onions, black olives, pineapple, bleh, no, 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 no pineapple please, uh, artichoke, spinach, and eggplant. Here, let's take a break. Feel free to fill out the cards choosing what toppings you want on your pizza kit. What would you guys have on your pizza, guys? Uh, honestly, uh, honestly, those, they, they don't sound like very good choices to me. <laughs> I don't like, I would probably have like sausage and, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm quite fussy. I don't know. I would at least have sausage. <laughs> Peyton checked pepperoni and mushrooms, not pineapple. Pineapple on pizza was an abomination. And did anybody really eat anchovies? An anchovy and pineapple pizza was the grossest combination she could imagine. If you're still undecided on what you want, hang on to your card. We'll collect the stranglers, the stranglers, the stragglers on the bus, Miss Bryant said. Next up is the pizza packaging center. Psst, Peyton, Marnie muttered. What? Peyton said. She was actually enjoying the pizza tour more than she thought she would. Let's go up these stairs. Marley cocked her head in the direction of a set of metal stairs leading up to some kind of catwalk. It was the type of staircase that had holes in the stairs so you could look through them and see how high you were off the ground. Peyton didn't want to be reminded how far she was from the ground. She hated heights. I don't know, Peyton said. We're supposed to stay in line with the rest of the group. Come on, this tour is boring. Marley flashed her most charming smile. Let's explore. See what's up there. No, we better not, Peyton said. But she could see that Marley had, had that look that meant she wouldn't take no for an answer. Molly grabbed Peyton's hand and pulled her. Come on, we'll just go up for a minute and have a peek. Don't be such an old lady. You act as you're as ancient as Mrs. Crutchfield. Peyton didn't want to seem like Mrs. Crutchfield. She wanted to be young and have fun while she still could. She sighed. Okay, but just for a minute. Peyton followed Marley up the rickety seeming metal stairs, trying not to look down at her feet. Steam from the vats of the production line was rising, making it look like they were walking into a cloud. They stood together on the narrow catwalk. Marley was energetic and laughing, but Peyton didn't like being there. The railings didn't see high enough to be safe, and a sign reading, Full warning, showed a stick man plummeting to his doom. It was unnerving. Can we go back down now? Peyton asked. As was always the case, when she was in a high place, her feet tingled and her stomach felt like it had, been mi it had migrated to the back of her throat. Not yet, Marley said. It's cool up here. All this steam makes it look like a horror movie where a monster comes out the fog and Molly lunged toward Peyton. Grabs you! Peyton felt like her heart was going to thud out of her chest. She took a deep breath and tried to get a hold of herself. Stop! You can't startle me like that! Not up here! Molly looked at her then grinned. Hey, you're really scared, aren't you? I don't like heights. Don't you remember how I wouldn't go on the Ferris wheel with you at the fair? She had intended to go on the ride and had even stood in line with Molly but had chickened out at the last minute. That's right, you stayed on the ground and just waved at me, Marley said. Well, there's no reason to be scared up here. I'm sure this factory has safety regulations. I'm sure it's safe to run. She did a quick sprint down the catwalk, then ran back to where Peyton was standing. Or to jump up and down. As Marley jumped, Peyton could feel the catwalk give way a little. It made a horrible creaking sound. She grabbed onto the railing, afraid she might be sick. Marley, please stop, Marley laughed. Why should I stop? Because you're scared. I'm having an awesome time and I'm sure everything's super safe. She looked at a sign reading, don't lean on the railings. I bet that's even safe. She leaned her back against one railing and then propelled herself forward to lean into one of the opposite side of the walkway. The railing wasn't safe. Molly plunged forward and down, disappearing into the rising steam. Peyton screamed, but the sound was drowned out by the whirring and grinding of the machinery below. Her heart pounding. Peyton ran down the stairs to look for her friend. She looked for Marley's injured body on the floor, but she was nowhere in sight. Peyton looked at the steaming vats of sauce being constantly stirred by a giant metal paddle. How hot was that sauce? How deep was the vat? Could a person fall into it and... She struggled with even thinking of the word live. 
But that was what she was asking, wasn't it? Could a person fall into one of those vats and live? In her heart, she wanted to believe it was possible, but her brain told her differently. She approached the two nearest vats and tried to sort out the sounds they were making from all the other sounds in the factory. Was it her imagination? Or was one of them making a smooth sloshing sound while the other one sounded more like a slosh, thump, slosh, thump? She stood and listened for a moment until the thumping stopped. Maybe because it really did, or maybe because it had been her imagination in the first place. She didn't know where Marley was, but there was one thing she did know. If Marley had fallen into one of those vats, there was no way Peyton could get her out. Maybe if she told Mrs. Crutchfield, somebody would do something. But here, too, her brain and her, uh, her heart and her brain had told her something different. She wanted to believe that Marley could be okay. But the fact said otherwise. She had fallen from a great height. The vats of tomato sauce were boiling hot. Several minutes had passed since the accident, which meant it was probably too late. Molly could feel a distant ringing in her ears, and her vision narrowed to a pinprick. Her parents' endless binge-watching of true crime shows told her that she, was going to, that she was going into shock. Her mind whirled. What if she told Mrs. Crutchfield? But the old woman said that it was Peyton's fault for not, taking Marley, for not talking Marley down. Or what if, it, what if her, one of her classmates accused Peyton of pushing Marley in? Marley was beautiful and popular. It wouldn't be long before kids started to talk. Maybe they'd think Peyton was jealous and there'd been no one to, there to see it beside Peyton herself. As if a switch had flipped on, Peyton felt herself going into self-preservation mode. It was too late to save Marley, but maybe she could at least save herself. Up ahead, the members of her class were heading toward the exit. If she just fell into line, maybe nobody would notice that she had wandered off for a few minutes. She took a deep breath and went to join her classmates. As they boarded the bus, what? <laughs> no. uh. As they boarded the bus, Mrs. Crutchfield stood next to the door and checked students' names off her list. Peyton had a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. She walked past Mrs. Crutchfield, boarded the bus, and took the same seat she had sat in on the way to the factory. It was glaringly obvious that the seat next to her was empty. After everybody else had taken their seats, Mrs. Crutchfield tottered over toward Peyton with a concerned look on her face. Do you know where Marley is? Mrs. Crutchfield asked, eyeing the empty seat. No, ma'am, Peyton said. It wasn't quite a lie. Marley could be in any one of the vats. <laughs> Peyton didn't know which one. <laughs> I don't think that's what she was asking. She wasn't asking which vat is she in. She was asking where in general is she. Oh, my God. Mrs. Crutchfield's eyes narrowed. Weren't the two of you together on the tour? We were for a while, but then we got separated, Peyton said. Once again, not really a lie. They got separated when Peyton remained on the catwalk and Marley fell from it. Marley said she thought the tour was boring. Maybe she just bailed and walked home. Without telling her best friend? Mrs. Crutchfield asked. Well, you know Marley, she's pretty independent. Mrs. Crutchfield was silent for a moment. You have her phone number, I presume? Yes, I do, ma'am. Peyton couldn't tell if Mrs. Crutchfield was really looking at her suspiciously or if she was just being paranoid. Mrs. Crutchfield nodded. Call her, please. Peyton's hand shook as she took out her phone and pulled up Marley's name on her contacts list. The phone didn't ring on Marley's end, probably because it had been cooked in a vat of tomato sauce. Cook cooked in a vat of tomato sauce, like Marley. Peyton had to swallow hard to keep from being sick. No answer, she said. Mrs. Crutchfield looked like she knew there was something Peyton wasn't telling her. Peyton figured Mrs. Crutchfield had been teaching far too long not to know when a kid wasn't being honest. Finally, thankfully, Mrs. Crutchfield broke eye contact. Well, I guess I'll have to alert her parents, she said. She turned and left Peyton. Oh, sorry, she turned and left. Peyton was relieved not to feel her penetrating stare anymore, but the relief didn't at last. One look at the empty seat beside her was all it took for her panic to return. When Peyton walked into the house, her mum was on the phone. Oh, here she is, she said. She held the phone out to Peyton. It's Marley's mum. She wants to talk to you. Peyton wanted to run, to go somewhere so far away that nobody could ask her any questions. But she held out her hand and took the phone. Hello, she said, her voice shaking. Peyton, when was the last time you saw Marley? Uh, she didn't come home? Peyton already felt like a liar. She knew Marley hadn't come home. If she had come home, I wouldn't be calling you. Marley's mom's voice broke into a sob. I'm sorry, that sounded rude. 
I'm just really upset. I know, me too. Marley's my best friend. Peyton wiped away a tear. She sat with me on the bus on the field trip. We got separated on the tour of the factory. Peyton winced as she said it, thinking of the moment they got separated, when Peyton st stayed standing on the catwalk and Marley fell, disappearing into the clouds of steam. She felt guilty talking to Marley's mum, but not guilty enough to tell the whole truth. Where was she when you last saw her? Peyton took a deep breath. Here comes the big lie, she thought. She was in line behind me when we were looking at the big containers of pizza toppings, but the next time I looked behind me she was gone. She said she was bored, so I thought maybe she'd bailed. She'd done it before. You're right, that wouldn't be out of character for Marley, Marley's mum said. Listen, if you ever remember any detail, anything, any little thing that might help us find her, call me. I will, Peyton said. She hit end on the phone, sank into her arms, an armchair and sobbed. Her mum appeared with a box of tissues and a glass of ice water. Here, drink some water. It's easy to get dehydrated when you're upset. Marley accepted some tissues and the glass of water, but her throat was so choked up it was hard to swallow. So she was just there behind you and then she was gone? Mama asked. Peyton nodded. Her mum sat down on the couch. You don't think somebody could have taken her, do you? I don't think so, Peyton said. I mean, I didn't see anybody else around. I don't think so either. Not when I'm being rational anyway. It's just that you, you see so much crazy stuff on the news nowadays, it's hard not to be paranoid, her mum said. Gina, Marley's mum, said they've already called the police, but Marley hasn't been gone long enough to be declared officially missing. I imagine the police will question everybody who works at the factory to make sure there weren't any creeps lurking around. Peyton hoped nobody at the factory would get in trouble over Marley's disappearance. She felt a tug at her conscience, telling her to come clean. But she had already lied so many to so many people today. Mrs. Crutchfield, Marley's mum, her own mum, that it was hard to imagine backtracking back, eh, back and telling the truth. If she was afraid of getting into trouble because she and Marley snuck off, it was nothing compared to the trouble she'd be in now. I think I'm still in shock, Peyton said. This statement, at least, was wholly true. But... Her mum reached out and patted her arm. Of course you are. I'm upset too. But you don't even like Marley. I don't dislike her. I just don't think she always makes the best choices, her mum said. And I'm devastated for Gina. This situation is every parent's worst nightmare. Peyton thought about the pain Marley's parents and little brother might be in. But would the pain be lessened if Peyton told the truth? At least if they had no clue about Marley, they could still hold out some hope. I think I need to go for a walk, try to clear my head a little, Peyton said. <sighs> oh, God. This this is like my worst nightmare as well. Um, it's, it's also the fact, like, this. I'm sure this has happened to everybody, where you start lying about something and then you can't stop lying, you know? Um, it's happened to me a few times, uh, and I'm very guilty of that. I don't want to be guilty of that, and I, and I want to lie about lying a lot, but I'll be honest, this has happened to me quite a few times, and it's devastating, and it really breaks you. Um, so I can feel, um, I can feel Peyton's pain here, but oh my god, <laughs> imagine being in this situation, what would you do? I guess you just have to tell the truth, right? You, you just have to. Otherwise, it's going to get worse and worse, and then the police are going to find out. And then, yeah, it's going to get even worse on there. Oh, my God. Where is this going to go? I don't know where this is going. Oh, my God. Okay. Her mum reached out, grabbed Peyton's hand, and squeezed it tight. Given what's happened with Marley, I'm kind of afraid to let you out of my sight. Peyton needed to get out of the house and have a few minutes in which she didn't have to think frantically about what to say and what not to say. I'm just going to walk around the block, mum like I do almost every day. Her mum let go of her hand. Okay, but don't be gone long. As soon as Peyton was out the door, she took big gulps of fresh air to try to calm herself. Maybe Marley didn't really fall in the vat, she told herself. Maybe Marley was okay. Maybe she had fallen, then gotten right up and walked off and just hadn't made it back home yet. But deep down, Peyton knew Marley wasn't okay, even if she had missed one of the vats. You couldn't fall from a height like that and be okay. At best, you'd have multiple broken bones. At worst, Peyton took another deep breath. She knew what the worst case scenario was, 
and she was pretty sure it had been Marley's fate. Peyton walked around the block, taking deep breaths and trying to shake the tension out of her arms. She probably looked like a crazy person, but she didn't care. Maybe she was a crazy person, or maybe she was turning into one. At some point, if she kept on telling lie after lie, would she be unable to distinguish lies from the truth? True. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a very good quote right there. She stopped at the corner of Brook and Branch where she had met Marley the week before. It had been such a normal night, an ice cream cone, some whispering about boys, a walk to the duck pond. It all seemed so innocent and simple. It felt like those things had happened a lifetime ago. But that had been before, and now it was after. Wh Why is before in capital and after in capital? I'm so confused with what this book is, man. <laughs> there was no way to bring the time before back, so she kept on walking. She walked past the houses and yards, and she walked past every day. Everything looked the same, but it wasn't, and would never be again. Hey, Peyton, a voice called as she neared her house. Peyton looked in the direction of the voice. Abigail was sitting in the wicker chair on her porch with a book in her lap and a glass of lemonade on the table beside her. As always, her mousy brown hair was pulled back in a careless ponytail and her glasses had slipped down on her nose. She was wearing yoga pants and a t-shirt that said, Shh, I'm reading. She looked, uncom she looked so uh, comfortable but also lonely somehow. Hey, Abigail. Usually Peyton just said hey and kept on walking. Today she stopped. What are you reading? Abigail looked a little surprised that Peyton was engaging her in conversation. Oh, it's just a mystery. It's about this girl who goes missing. It's pretty good. A missing girl. Great, Peyton thought. You know, I don't read much. Uh, I don't read as much as I used to, Peyton said. When Peyton and Abigail had been friends, they swapped books back and forth all the time. They had read together and talked about what they were reading. They had been a two-girl book club. But when the friendship with Marley started, there was so much real-life drama and intrigue that there had been no time for books. Maybe, Peyton said, you could recommend some good ones to me. I miss... I miss reading. She'd almost said, I miss you, but stopped herself. It was true, though. She did miss Abigail. She'd only just realised it. While the other girls knew Peyton... Uh, while the other girls Peyton knew had changed a lot when they started high school, Worrying about makeup and clothes and what other people thought of them, Abigail seemed the same as she ever was. It was kind of nice. Say, Abigail set her book down on the table. Would you like a glass of lemonade? Suddenly Peyton realised she was very thirsty. Yeah, a glass of lemonade would be great. Abigail stood. I'll be right back. She disappeared into the house. She came back with a tall, sweating glass. Jack, her fat Siamese cat, followed her out of the front door, rubbing against her legs. You can come up on the porch, she said. Thanks. Peyton climbed the steps to the porch and accepted the glass of lemonade from Abigail. Jack butted Peyton's legs with his head, and she bent down to pet him. You remember Jack, Abigail said. Of course I remember Jack, Peyton said, petting him under his chin. He's unforgettable. I remember when he was a tiny kitten, but he's a big boy now. A big fat boy, Abigail said. But he still thinks he's a tiny kitten. Would you like to sit down? The time they had spent apart was making their meetings strangely formal, like two people who had just met and were being careful not to offend each other. Sure, thanks. Peyton sat and sipped her lemonade. It was cold and tart and bracing, the way she liked it. I'm sorry about Marley, Abigail said. You know about that? Peyton said. The high school gossip machine worked fast, apparently. It was all over school this afternoon, Abigail said. People said that when the bus came back from... The home economics field trip, Marley wasn't on it. Yeah, Peyton said. It's weird. We were touring the factory and it was like she was just there and then she wasn't. She didn't want to lie to Abigail now that they had just started talking again. So she decided to stick to the statements that were technically the truth. Abigail nodded. You know, I've never really liked Marley, but I wouldn't want something bad to happen to her. And that's what people were saying, that something bad happened. This afternoon, somebody said that one of the kids on the field trip said they heard a scream. Peyton swallowed hard. Had Marley f screamed as she fell? And if so, would it have been possible for someone to hear her over the noise of the factory's machinery? Everything that happened surrounding the accident was such a blur. Peyton can remember rejoining the group. 
mindlessly filling out her pizza order card and turning it in, then sitting on the bus next to a conspicuously empty seat. The whole experience was as hazy in her mind as a dream. I want you to know, Abigail said, that even though I dislike Marley, I don't wish her ill. I genuinely hope she's okay. You're jealous of Marley, aren't you? Peyton asked. She realised with some embarrassment that she hadn't spent much time thinking about Abigail's feelings. Oh, do you think? Abigail sounded irritated. I was your best friend and you ditched me to be best friends with her. How could I not be jealous? Peyton couldn't meet Abigail's eyes. I didn't really ditch you, we just grew apart. Well then, we grew apart very suddenly, so you could be Marley's best friend instead. You really hurt my feelings, Peyton. Peyton felt a sharp pain in her heart, like a bee had stung her there. I'm sorry. There was a long pause and Abigail seemed to let out a breath she'd be holding in this whole time. It's okay, I forgive you. Thank you. Peyton was glad she could be forgiven of this, at least. And I hope Marley's okay and I understand that she's your best friend now, but you know, sometimes maybe you and I could, you know, hang out. We're hanging out now, Peyton said, letting herself smile a little. Abigail smiled back. Yeah, but this is our first time hanging out since you ditched me, so it's super awkward. All the things Peyton liked about Abigail came flooding back to her in a rush. Her sense of humour, her intelligence, her honesty. She laughed. It is. It's so awkward. Peyton saw her mum walking down the sidewalk, a panicked look on her face. Mum, Peyton called. Hey mum, I'm over here. <laughs>